take two, um, renal physiology. Um, so when you are starting renal physiology, there are two really important things to do. First of all, you need to remember um, all of the microscopic anatomy. You need to know proximal convoluted tubule, loop, distal convoluted tubule, ascending limb, de uh, descending limb, ascending limb, um, collecting duct. You need to know all of that. You need to know peritubular capillaries, um, renal corpuscles. So if you're if you're a little sketchy on remembering the anatomy. It's all right here with figure references. There's also a good anatomy review and in interactive physiology. So take a minute and do that because otherwise this stuff is just so terminology intensive if you don't remember the anatomy. And then the other thing that's really important to do is, oh, by the way, I gave you a place to um, label the anatomy and color code um, the um, vascular component of the nephron and the tubular component of a nephron, you need to know what contains blood and what contains pee. Okay, and the other really important thing is to know these terms, filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion. So um, let me introduce you, I mean you, you were introduced in anatomy, I'm quite certain, but um, let me introduce you to these terms in a little bit more detail and then we'll refer back to it as we go through today. So um, what the kidneys do, among other things, is um, as the blood goes through, and remember, ultimately it came in from the renal artery and it's going to go back into the renal vein. As the blood goes through and gets to these microscopic structures that are right at the junction of the cortex and the medulla, <clears throat> called nephrons, there are a million nephrons per kidney, what happens is um, the blood coming into the kidney is right next to um, what we call the uriniferous tubule or the tubular component. And because they're so close and because they're both made of a layer of simple epithelium, we can have exchange between blood and what will be urine. It's not cold urine until it hits the collecting duct, but um, still blood and urine. So, And as we do that exchange, we can move things from the blood to the urine and leave them there if we want to excrete them. We can move them from the blood to the urine and then look and say, oh, I want to bring it back in. So let's look at these terms um, and make sure that when you are studying, you're really, really specific about using the terms correctly. Okay, so um, basically what we have at a nephron, obviously this is not an anatomical drawing because I'm not capable of drawing anatomical drawings. Um, what we have is blood tubes next to P-tubes. And of course the blood tubes are capillaries and the P-tubes are primarily the tubule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and distal convoluted tubule. And what's going to happen is a three-step process um, and then whatever ends up um, staying in the filtrate slash urine will end up being excreted, okay? And whatever ends up staying in the blood will go back into the renal vein. So let's look at the three steps. The first step is pressure driven and it is called filtration and you've learned about filtration as a process before. Filtration moves things, primarily water and anything water soluble, from high pressure to low pressure. Okay, so um, let me ask you which of these two fluids, blood or filtrate slash urine, is going to be higher pressure. And hopefully you understand that, of course, that's blood because, of course, it's got a pump hooked up to it. So the direction that filtration moves things is from the blood into the pee filtrate, which will later become urine. What kinds of things does it move? Just to get us started thinking about it, lots and lots of water. 47 gallons of water are filtered out per day. But then um, water-soluble solutes like ions because they're small and they'll fit through the holes. Um, and um, also water-soluble nutrients like glucose and amino acids. And then also water-soluble waste like urea um, and other wastes. Urea, uric acid, all that kind of stuff. Okay, but this is a really general process. It's really just kind of dumping everything from the blood into the urine, not being selective about what it dumps. So it's going to dump anything water soluble that will fit through the holes and then lipid soluble things will do whatever they want. So 
um, kind of just dumping everything out there. And then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to selectively pick through what was in the filtrate and bring it back in via the process of reabsorption. Um, and reabsorption is selective, meaning it'll use specific carriers and pumps and that kind of stuff to bring back in a whole bunch of things. Well, first of all, it will bring back in water. That's not through a carrier or pump, I'll tell you the mechanism. It will also bring back in all of the nutrients it possibly can. You do not want to leave glucose in the pee if you can avoid it. And it will bring back in ions pretty much just as needed. So if I was calcium deficient. If I filtered out calcium, I would bring back in a bunch of it. But if I had eaten a one pound bag of Doritos and I filtered out sodium, I'd just leave it out there because there's probably still plenty in my bloodstream. So reabsorption is selective. And then the third process is secretion. And secretion is selective too. Again, using carriers and pumps and things like that to move um, Anything that I didn't catch in the bloodstream but needed to get rid of, I didn't catch it the first time with filtration because I wasn't really being selective. So primarily what I will move out is wastes and excesses. That's just sort of an introduction to how this works. There are exceptions to each of those things. Okay, so whatever ends up leaving um, is excreted. So it's called excretion. So the equation, let's look at that one more time, is excretion equals filtration minus reabsorption plus secretion. Okay, that is the equation. Okay, so what you're basically going to be doing is as the blood moves through the kidney and you have blood tubes next to P-tubes at nephrons, you are going to be doing these processes. And by virtue of doing these processes, you are going to be figuring out how much water to hold on to versus get rid of. Um, so you're regulating the water concentration of the blood plasma and also of the urine. Um, you're also regulating your ion composition by again deciding how much to hold on to versus get rid of. And when you're regulating your water composition, you're also regulating your blood plasma volume and therefore your blood pressure. So that's really important. And then of course you're doing what you've known that the kidneys do since you were a kid, which is get rid of waste products like urea and uric acid and creatinine and a bunch of those kinds of things. And you're getting rid of foreign chemicals like drugs and pesticides and food additives, if they're water soluble. Lipid soluble ones you can't get rid of very easily at the kidney. Um, and then the kidney also has some other functions that um, a couple of them we've talked about before and some of them we haven't. The kidney does make two hormones, both of which we've learned before. EPO, erythropoietin, is made in response to the kidney detecting hypoxia and will target the red bone marrow to cause erythropoiesis. We learned about that one. And then the kidney makes renin. Um, which is a precursor to angiotensin II. And that is arguably a hormone because it affects multiple places, but not really in the renin. So it, it's hormonal-ish, hormone-ish, we should say that. Okay, and then the kidney also does a couple of things that we haven't learned about before, which is the kidney is necessary for not making, but activating one of the forms of vitamin D3. So kidney problems can cause problems with vitamin D3 and therefore calcium. And um, the kidney also has the ability to do a little bit of gluconeogenesis. Um, gluconeogenesis, remember, is, of course, taking amino acids and making glucose out, them, out, out of them. It's nowhere near as robust at doing it as the liver is, but it can do a little bit. Okay, so um, the formation of urine, we're going to get to the three phases of that. I'm going to show you a little video at the beginning of the next one. Um, a little animation, and then we'll get started on all of these processes.